There used to be something called natural theology, um, seeking in the observed world evidences of divine intervention. And it w in particular, it was felt that only divine intervention could explain the wonderful capabilities of human beings. Uh, the classic statement of that is, was by Archdeacon William Paley in his 1802 book, Natural Theology or Evidences of the Existence and Attributes of the Deity. And indeed, I, I just happened to read a biography of Cardinal Manning, who led the Roman Catholic Church in England, and he credited this with um, converting him to the Christian faith. Well, we all know that that argument was invalidated by the theory of evolution through natural selection of Darwin and Wallace. And now, with the work of modern evolutionary biologists, even the aspects of human life that seem most spiritual, that seem most evidences of a divinely created soul, our love for one another, our sense of loyalty, of honesty, of charity, um, appear to have, and I don't know how well accepted this is, many of you know more about this than I do, but appear to have evolutionary explanations in terms, again, of uh, an unplanned evolution through natural selection. Um, some people find this very hard to swallow. Uh, even an excellent scientist like Francis Collins has said that this sort of argument, w evolution, will never explain special human attributes such as the knowledge of the moral law and the universal search for God. Well, some evolutionary biologists think it will. Uh, we can't prove that God never intervenes uh, because the world is too complicated a place. Uh, but increasingly, as the centuries pass, we see less and less need to assume any divine intervention. Uh, the famous opinion uh, expressed by the Marquis de Laplace to Napoleon uh, when Laplace explained the working of the solar system according to Newton's laws, and uh, Napoleon asked, where in this is there a place for God? And uh, Laplace said, sire, I have no need of that hypothesis. Uh, the fact, in this way, through the ordinary workings of science, we can explain things like the fact that the Earth is such a comfortable place. Uh, a colleague of mine at the University of Texas, some kind of spiritual advisor to or at any rate an advisor to George Bush, Martin Olasky, had a column in our local newspaper in which he explained that the uh, marvelous uh, suitability of the earth for life was some kind of evidence for divine benevolence. And of course, that would be a good argument, in fact, if the earth were the only planet in the universe. But with billions of planets in the universe, it's natural that some of them are suitable for life, and uh, it's only on the planets that are suitable for life that there are people asking questions about it. Uh, in the same way, in the different parts of the multiverse, if indeed it's true that the constants of nature vary from one part to another, uh, then this picture provides a natural explanation of the fact that the laws of nature are suitable for the appearance of life. In many parts of the multiverse, they may not be. Uh, the power of this uh, kind of reasoning has been recognized in a rather infamous um, article in the New York Times by Card Cardinal Christoph Schönborn, the Archbishop of Vienna, in July 2005. Uh, his article concludes as follows. Now, at the beginning of the 21st century, faced with scientific claims like neo-Darwinism and the multiverse hypothesis in cosmology, invented to avoid the overwhelming evidence for purpose and design found in modern science, the Catholic Church will again defend human nature by proclaiming that the imminent design evident in nature is real. 
scientific theories that try to explain away the appearance of design as the result of chance and necessity are not scientific at all, but as John Paul put it, an abdication of human intelligence. Well, I have to say that uh, I was gratified by this to some extent because we physicists feel that you evolutionary biologists get all the fun in, in uh, this political argument about the role of science. And at least Cardinal Schoenborn rep re recognizes that work in cosmology can also be interesting. <laughs> this, uh, there's no, I would say that although, uh, as shown by this statement, there is opposition to specific scientific ideas within Western Christianity, uh, there's not really an opposition to the idea of science itself, only to some of its conclusions. I think this is different in the world of Islam. And it, it's really quite tragic because, as, as we know, Islam led the world in, the ninth, in science in the ninth century at a time, uh, I mean, the, the famous statement by Philip Hitty in his book about the Arabs that uh, the caliphs al-Mamun and al-Rashid were delving into Greek philosophy and science at a time when Charlemagne and his nobles were struggling with the art of writing their names. Um, many of the scientists of, the, uh, of this great period of Islamic science, science were rather non-religious. Uh, some of them, like Razis, actually hostile to religion, although some, I'm, I must say, like Al-Tuzi and Avicenna were, were quite religious. But it was a mixed picture. Uh, but then there was a reaction against science in the Islamic world in the 12th century. And it was not a reaction so much against any one particular conclusion of science as against the very idea of laws of nature. Uh, because it was felt that lo the laws of nature put God's hands in chains. This was particularly uh, the view of an influential philosopher, Abu Hamid al-Ghazali, who wrote a book, uh, The Incoherence of the Philosophers. Uh, he rejected the idea of the laws of nature. He explained, for example, that if you put a piece of cotton in the fire and it turns black and smolders, it's not because of the heat, it's because God wants it to turn black and smolder. Everything is a special occasion for the will of God. Whether it was Al-Ghazali's influence or, or whatever, or perhaps the uh, depression due to military defeats in Spain, Islamic si science really ended uh, at the, by the end of the uh, 12th century. And um, today we have the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt that calls for an end of education in science. I had a, a dear friend now no longer with us, Abdus Salam, uh, a Pakistani, uh, although like all scientists I know of Muslim origin who do significant work, he was educated and works in the West, not in Muslim countries. Uh, he tried for many years to get the oil-rich states of the Persian Gulf uh, to invest in universities, including science education, and he found that um, they were quite open to the idea of technology, but tried to divorce it from fundamental science because they f felt that fundamental science uh, would pose problems for their religious faith. My feeling is they were probably right about that. Uh, well, I've mentioned three uh, areas of hostility uh, that the laws of nature put God's hands in chains. They downgrade humans from the central, science downgrades humans from a central role, and it uh, provides alternative explanations. But there's another one which may be the deepest area of conflict between science and religion, although I don't think it gets mentioned so often, and that is in the method of approach to truth. Uh, religion largely relies on authority. It may be the authority of sacred texts, as in Sunni Islam and Protestant Christianity, or texts together with religious leaders who are divinely uh, inspired to interpret them, like Shiite Islam and Roman Catholicism. 
Uh, we don't have anything like that in the world of science. I, and I want to make a clear distinction. We do have heroes. As scientists, we have enormous respect for. But they're not authorities to whom we go for solution of scientific problems. For example, in my field, certainly Einstein is the greatest hero of the 20th century. But no one today arguing about the theory of gravitation would settle the issue by referring back to Einstein's papers of 1915, 1916. Uh, today, it's understood that any reasonably good graduate student understands general relativity better than Einstein did. We have learned, we have progressed, and we, so in science we don't have prophets. We have heroes, but not prophets. And I, I think that uh, another difference in the approach to truth is that uh, we try hard in science to stamp out the influence of wishful thinking. Whereas so much of, of religious thought seems to be nothing else. Uh, I must believe in the afterlife because how could I face it if I was going to, if my life was going to terminate at death? The one thing that science cannot do, however, any more than religion can, is to justify itself. Uh, as David Hume understood long ago, you cannot use scientific arguments as a justification for science itself because that's circular. It's a moral choice between the methods of approaching truth of religion, the reverence for authority, uh, the search for think beliefs that will make us happy, and the more austere, self-reliant approach to truth of religion. For me, the moral choice is clear, but it is a moral choice and one that can't be, I think, argued about rationally. Uh, so what do, we, what do we do about this conflict? Um, there are those uh, whose views about religion are not very different from my own, but who nevertheless feel that we should try to damp down the conflict, that we should compromise it. Uh, for example, Steve Gould, and uh, he can correct me if I'm wrong because he's here, Larry Krauss, feel that it's most important to maintain the integrity of scientific teaching and we should try to enlist the mainline religions who are often perfectly uh, comfortable with teaching Darwinism, say, in school, as our allies uh, and not step on their toes by talking about a confrontation between science and religion. Ed Wilson, another dear friend, uh, wants to enlist the mainline religious denominations as allies in the defense of the environment. I, I respect their views uh, and, I, and I understand their motives and uh, I don't condemn them, but I'm not having it. To me, the conflict for, between science and religion is more important than these issues of science education or even environmentalism. I think um, the world needs to wake up from its long nightmare of religious belief. And uh, anything that we scientists can do to weaken the hold of religion uh, should be done and may, in fact, in the end, be our greatest contribution to civilization. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, would you mind taking a sure. chair? And since, since you invoked uh, Lawrence Krauss, um, perhaps we'll bring him up.